Well, first, this is great. I love seeing such a large audience. And, you know, it's kind of novel because it's mostly women, which is kind of weird. I mean, I don't know. Well, I usually I'm teaching audiences that are at least 70% male and typically much more so. So it's kind of a different perspective. So we'll see where we go tonight. But what I want to do is talk about um, women negotiating well. And, the, you know, I've got this sort of formal title, The Effects of Gender and Expectations on Negotiating Performance. But the sort of the working title in my head is kind of oxymoron, right? You know, can <laughs> women negotiate well? Or is there something inherent in who we are? Is it genetic? Is it gendered? What is it that keeps us from being effective negotiators? Um, and, you know, if it's genetic or gendered, we're kind of, you know, maybe it's a problem. But maybe it's not. Maybe it's something much more malleable. We're going to sort of walk through a lot of the research uh, and give you some ideas about how to be more effective. Obviously, I probably wouldn't be standing up here if I thought it was that anatomy was destiny, right? <laughs> so you can, we can sort of give you a solution to this already, and that is... Uh, we can change. We can actually be much more effective negotiators. And so what we're going to do is we're going to sort of start off with a little thought experiment. What I want us to sort of think about is what happens, you know, let's, let's sort of act as if we're just finishing up our, our experience here at Stanford. We're about to go out into the world. And after two wonderful years at Stanford, maybe you were getting an MBA, you're finally faced with your dream opportunity. The company or another university or a startup, wherever you want to end up working, um, that you pursued has finally made an offer to you in a package that seems quite generous. And so I've given you a whole series of details. You know, bonuses, relocation expenses, you know, great. They're very excited about having you come and join the company and would like to have your formal acceptance in hand by next week. And, of course, there are others who, that they would be considering if, for some reason, you choose not to come. So they really do need you to respond. Uh, especially if you're not planning on joining them. So the question is, what do you do? Pretty much, you accept the offer. If you're the typical female, right? You don't attempt to alter the terms of the compensation contracts. If this were a group of males, the odds are that they would have a very different set of answers to that. And the research actually is very consistent with that. So let's, let's talk a little bit about our sort of self-imposed um, failures for just a second. If you haven't read the book, Women Don't Ask, by Linda Babcock, you may want to get a copy, but don't sort of read it if you're kind of depressed, because it's unrelentingly. <laughs> it is. It's sort of like, you know, the good news is very rare in that book. Um, but part of it is it's a very realistic picture of the relationship that women have with the negotiation process. And what she found out, and the reason that Linda actually wrote the book, um, they was that they started a number of years before the book came out when she was the acting dean at Carnegie uh, Mellon, where she's a faculty member. And what she was doing was she was asking basically what we, we typically do is we say, okay, we have these MBAs. How are they doing out in the market? And what she did was she noticed as she did the analysis for a particular group of MBAs, that uh, the starting salaries of the male MBAs were, were significantly higher than the starting salary of the females. In fact, about 7.6%. Now, for those of you who are more legalistic in your perspective on this, you might say, aha, prima facie case of discrimination. Here we go. It's, here it is again. Um, and because it is the case that these women are and these men are having had the last two years the exact same experience, and they end up being paid significantly differently. And so the question that Linda was asking is, you know, is this what the companies do, or is it something more insidious? And she did a little bit of digging, and what she found was when she asked the MBAs, so you got a job offer, what did you do after that? Only 7% of the women, while... 57% of the men attempted to negotiate the terms of their employment contract. And of those who negotiated, most of whom were men, what she found was that on average they increased their starting salaries by just over 7%. Now, it turns out that there was no difference between men and women's success rates once they initiated the negotiation. 
but there was huge differences in, people, in women's willingness to actually engage the process. So, actually it turns out, there was, there's another example. This is a, a laboratory study that was done. And what they did was they, they um, uh, recruited subjects, undergraduate students, and they asked them to come and do a very boring activity. Very detailed, but very boring. And they told them in the recruitment, we basically we'll be paying you between two and ten dollars for your participation. So they had them do this incredibly obnoxious task for a very long period of time. And then at the end they said, here's your two dollars. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Men were nine times more likely to say, excuse me, uh, two dollars to ten, this is, I did much more work than for two dollars. And basically, request more compensation for the time they spent than were the women. Although, there was no differences in complaining about how abused they were, right? But the men actually did something about it and the women took their $2 and left, okay? Well, the, the thing I want to raise and sort of, ser sort of serve as our jumping off point is really just for us to consider what is the cost of not asking? And so I want to give you another little thought experiment, um, but not about you so much, but let's just talk about Chris and Frazier. Now, these are two individuals at age 30. They get job offers for $150,000 per year from the same company. Okay? So far, so good. Great salary. Chris negotiates the terms of the contract and gets an increase to $160,500, which is just about 7.6%. And Frazier says, I can't believe anybody would actually pay me $150,000 a year. <laughs> and if, if I do really well, they're going to go ahead and reward me because my good works will be rewarded. And so they spend the next 35 years of the company, they receive exactly the same 5.5% annual raise every year. Basically, what I want to know is, what was Fra what's the cost that Frazier incurred for the decision 35 years ago not to negotiate? And what I wanted to do to think about it in terms of how many more years will Frazier have to work to equal Chris's wealth state at retirement? Got a guess? Five, five, five. five years. Fifteen years. Actually, it's almost in the middle. Nine. So while Chris can retire at 65 at a particular wealth state, Frazier has to work till 74. Now you might say, women live longer. <laughs> Is this how you want to spend your time? Working longer, being paid less? Well, it turns out that this is a very generous comparison because you see what it said was every year, Chris and Frazier get exactly the same raise. But you know, it turns out that if you're not willing to negotiate, that may have more far-reaching implications for how people perceive you in the positive and the negative. So we're going to get the positive first, right? So what, let's, what if instead of getting 5% equal raises, that Chris actually gets 5.5? Because, you know, Chris negotiated, which means Chris is at a higher salary, and one of the quick metrics we use is how much are you worth? How much do you make? And he or she who makes more obviously is worth more to the organization. That's why we pay you more. So, and you know what? It turns out if it's 5.5% and I get 5%, most of us probably wouldn't complain. I mean, you know, that's just, that's not even worth getting upset about, right? Well, how much longer now? Oh, yeah. And what if it's 1%? Okay, let's just, let's just, this is how bad it gets. Okay? Chris, Frazier can't work long enough to equal Chris's wealth state, okay? So, you know, it turns out that the cost of not successfully you're negotiating your first, you know, your job, a minimum of nine years, maybe as much as 50 additional years, okay? This is how, you know, so I hope you like your job because you're going to be working at it a whole lot longer for a lot less money, right? And the question that we really have to sort of address here is, how much is that discomfort, 
right? How much is that concern you have about negotiating worth to you, right? In the, in the best case scenario, right, it's worth nine years of your life. That seems like a lot to pay for being uncomfortable. So, I know. Think about this. So that's actually, that's what I want you to remember the next time you are in a job employment contract negotiation or have the opportunity for it. You say, I don't I'm wondering if they're going to like me. <laughs> like nine years of extra work, okay? <laughs> so, why the difference? Well, if you go back to the 1960s and you look at the research on gender and negotiation, they called it sex differences back then, what you found was males achieve better negotiating outcomes when negotiating against women. Absolutely. Very consistently. And you also found, by the way, um, that minorities, African Americans in this case, had much worse outcomes than did majority, Caucasians, okay, when they negotiated against each other. And so you might first think, well, maybe it's gender, but it turns out that in the 1980s, when these studies were redone, no difference, either among African Americans and Caucasians or among men and women. And the question is, well, if it, obviously then it's not gendered, right, because there's still men and women and African Americans and, and Caucasians. What was the difference? Well, one of the things that happens is it's that something else. It's one of the banes of science sometimes. It's called the unmeasured third variable. And in this case, the unmeasured third variable probably was power. Because in the early 60s, if you look at African Americans or women, they were typically drawn from the less powerful pools. And so what the researchers now believe is that, in fact, we have a more generalized phenomenon, which is some, there are people who negotiate who do better because they're higher power. Now, in the 60s, those people tended to be women and minorities. In the 80s, it was more general. You actually found women in high power positions, and so you didn't find the effect. And in fact, Carol Watson uh, was one of the authors of a study, of a, of a meta-analysis, who basically first proposed that in fact the power differences were responsible, not gender. And basically that's what she found. Power was a better predictor of these differences than was gender. Now, it also turns out that here's an interesting, we're going to sort of add a couple of little bit levels of complexity here. It turns out that value creation in a negotiation is typically produced by the low power player. Why? What can the high power player do? Just take it, right? They say, yeah, I'm high power, I can, I can claim a lot of value. In order for the low power player to get some value in the interaction, he or she must be able to create the value and then give a portion of it, probably a majority, but still, I, you know, it's, it's a lot better to divide up a really big pie than a really little pie, right? And so what happens is we know that that the low power player creates the value and the high power player primarily takes the value. <coughs> and it also turns out there's been a whole series of studies. My colleague Deborah Grunfeld here uh, at, at uh, Stanford uh, has done a whole series of studies looking at the experience of the powerful. And what she finds is that power, and by the way, this is not a gendered phenomenon. Women have the same problems as men. Let me give you the example. This is a great study. It's called the chocolate chip cookie eating study, okay? So what she did was she actually had people who were high and low power in, in the world come in, or what she did is she took just normal people, right? And so what she did was, let's say that we've got these two people up here, Amanda and Julie, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to prime them. So I'm going to say, Julie, what I want you to do, Amanda, you can't hear this. Julie, what I want you to do is I want you to think about a time when you were really powerful, okay? So you were in a situation, you were powerful. Amanda, I want, to think, want you to think about a time when you were really powerless, okay? A situation where you really did not have the power, you were at the mercies of other people, okay? Think about those situations. Now I want you to engage in an activity, which of course is irrelevant because this has nothing to do with the study. I primed them, and now here's the study. So, so they, they did this activity, which was they had to create a joint product. And the experimenter said, now that you've created this product, I need to go and evaluate it. So while I'm gone, Here's a plate of chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> Feel free to eat as many as you wish. We have lots. Okay? <laughs> and left the room. And as she left the room, 
She turned on the video camera because this was the real experiment. And what did she do? What did they do? Who ate more chocolate chip cookies? Julie the high power or Amanda the low power? <laughs> Julie, right? She ate more. But that's not particularly exciting. Let me tell you the really cool result. When Julie and Amanda left, the experimenter measured the cookie crumb spray pattern from each of the two. <laughs> Controlling for the number of cookies eaten, who had the biggest spray pattern? Julie, the high power, or Amanda, the low power? Julie. Now, see, you've often, you probably thought that people in high power have bad manners, <laughs> right? You wonder, does it take bad manners to become a high-powered person? Right, because you've seen it. You've been in situations they spit food on you, <laughs> right? They take their shoes off in public. I mean, what, what is going on here, right? You sort of think of them, did their parents not train them? <laughs> of course their parents trained them. And if they were a low-power player, they wouldn't be doing that. But they're a high-power player, they do it because they can. Because what happens is they're disinhibited. Power disinhibits. That's why I can take as much as I want, because I don't have this sort of social mores controlling me, right? And so, by the way, if you wondered if there were a gender effect, uh, not really. It turns out that men and women behave the same way in terms of spreading crumbs <laughs> and eating cookies. In fact, you may have also seen, this is a very famous study that was done uh, by Ian Ayers and his co-authors, and basically it says, you know, car dealer negotiations, right? And what they did was they brought in confederates, right? So a white male, a white female, a black male, or a black female, and then at, basically engaged in a, in, a, in a car negotiation. And what you see is what the initial offer the dealership made to them and the profit from that initial offer and the markup that they were expecting to get if the, if the confederate had accepted that offer, and then the final offer after negotiation that the dealership made to them. Now, these, these confederates obviously never bought the car, but they engaged in this negotiation, and the only difference in their, there was no differences in what they said or how they behaved. The only differences was that were their gender and their races. Now, what you see here, there's not, it's not a gendered effect, right? Because what you see, while men and women, white males and females, uh, had a, a difference, uh, we see the inverse relationship in, in African American males and females. Well, what we want to talk about here is about what's called stereotyped threat. And it turns out that a person, a stereotyped threat is what a person feels when they're, when they're concerned they might actually verify a negative stereotype about their group. Okay? And by the way, Claude Steele, who's also here at Stanford, argues that what happens is I get concerned about, uh, about reifying this stereotype, and in doing so, I reify the stereotype, <laughs> right? And so what happens is, I mean, this is, the studies have been absolutely riveting in terms of their effects. For example, in terms of the game of golf, it turns out if we have white athletes, by the way, the stereotype is white athletes are high in sports intelligence and black athletes are high in natural ability. Okay, that's the stereotype. So when, a, when golf was conveyed to young athletes as a test of sports intelligence, the white golfers did better than the black golfers. But when it was deemed to be natural ability, the black golfers did better than the white golfers. It's not who's better golfer, it's the expectations we have, right? This was even, this was great. This was a study, they got a, students, right, about to take a math test. And before they took the math test, they said, we're going to take, we have two groups here. Here's, here's group, students A and students B. So the first group in students A, they were told, before you take the test, what I want you to do is I want you to think about your life. Imagine yourself as a college professor, okay? And then take the test. And in this group, they said, we want you to imagine your life as a soccer hooligan. <laughs> it's what they chose in the study. I just report these things, right? And now take the math test. And it turns out that the people who imagined their lives as a college professor did statistically significantly better on the math test than the soccer hooligan group, right? It turns out if, if we're doing the same kind of behavior and we can take Asian women, if I 
raise your, your perspective of your uh, identity as an Asian, you'll do better in a math test. And as a woman, you'll do worse. <laughs> right? I mean, so that, this is how malleable these things are. Right? Well, let's talk about negotiation now. Because it turns out that, in fact, we can think about a female positive stereotype about negotiating, saying that highly skilled negotiators have a keen ability to express their thoughts verbally, good listening skills, and insight into another's feelings. This is actually the uh, manipulation that was done in an experiment where males and females were asked to negotiate against each other. And in half the groups, they were given, they said, highly skilled negotiators. They didn't work, the female positive stereotype is our label for convenience sake. But they were simply told the, the, uh, the description. They were not told the label. Then the other half were given this gender neutral. Highly skilled negotiators are well prepared, have a sense of humor, and are open minded. Doesn't seem very gendered, does it? But you know what? It was a negotiation task. And it turns out that we think of negotiation not as a gender neutral thing, but it's a male task. So, one of the things that's great to think about what, when you ask men, how do we, make an analogy to a negotiation, and you see their analogies are to competitive sports. For women, it's a dental trip. <laughs> okay? You can sort of see now why this is like what males do. We don't do this, right? And so what happens is even in hypothetical situations, men typically outperform women. So, um, and here's some examples, right? In a study involving preparation for a hypothetical job interview, men plan to make higher opening bids, to turn down offers of higher level, and to settle for higher salaries than did women. When MBA participants conducted a salary negotiation with a confederate, right, so somebody who was actually under the auspices of the experimenter, so it wasn't just two parties, it turns out that women set lower goals and negotiated lower salaries than did the men. This is pretty sad. I and mean, this is like, this is why the book, Women Don't Ask, is so, I mean, this is depressing, right? But there's hope. And so now we're going to go to the hope. And here's the results of what we, we sort of saw, and that is when women had the female positive stereotype, look at the results. This is, by the way, this is in aspirations. This is what they aspired to. And it turns out that when they had the female positive result, the women had higher aspirations than did the men about how they were going to perform. And when they had the gender neutral, the men had much higher aspirations, and it appears as if the women were more reactive. So we were actually pushed down even further. And here are the results of the performance. And it turns out, in this case, you need to see the bottom line. Higher values equals better outcomes for men. When the gender neutral condition, the men did better than the women, in the female positive, the women did better than the men. Turns out, it's not about gender. It's not about anatomy. What it's about is about expectations. So what they then tried to do was say, if it's truly about expectations, we can get people to perform worse or perform poorly and do it for males and females very, very, actually very easily. So what they did was, these particular researchers basically said, you know what, once again, males and females negotiating against each other, and they said, negotiators who display, who display the following behaviors tend to perform worse. They have a high regard for personal interests. They depend on assertive behaviors. They rely on rational analysis, and they don't dis display emotions. Those negotiators tend to perform worse. Or they got the information that negotiators who, who display the following behaviors tend to perform worse. They are passive or reactive. They depend on their own listening skills. They rely on intuition, and they're quite willing to share emotions. Those people perform worse. And here are the results. What you see here is, well, what we, this is a perfect interaction effect. What you see is, when the female negative stereotype was in play, the men significantly outperformed the women. When the negative male stereotype was in play, the females significantly outperformed the men. So anatomy is not destiny. But here's the problem. Some of you may be thinking now, it's too bad about all those other women because, you know, I don't have this problem. <laughs> have you said to yourself somewhere in your life, yes, women are discriminated against, but it hasn't happened to me? <laughs> I've said those words. I actually said those. And now I think, what an idiot. 
Because what happens is we don't want, we, we certainly know that our referent group can be discriminated against, but it's not going to happen to us. This is the illusion of positivism. Good things happen to me and bad things don't, right? And it also, by the way, but here's the other problem. All, there's all sorts of, of factors that lead us to be affected by these kinds of outcomes. For example, as I said earlier, employers tend to assume that if you're paid more, you're worth more, right? So we have males and females being paid differentially, and what are people going to think about competence? And, by the way, how many of you said this? Think about this. I'm not going to negotiate because, you know, that's really too aggressive. What I want to do is I'll do good works and I will be recognized. <laughs> you shaking your heads, yes, aren't you? Raising your hands. You know, you know what? Perhaps in another life, maybe in the afterlife, <laughs> right? But not now. Not now. And maybe that's what you're waiting for. I don't know. You know, you want to work really long and you want to, you know. Anyway. But it turns out, too, that what also happens is the more ambiguous the situation, the worse we perform. Uh, Harvard MBAs, we did yet another study, and this is actually Linda Babcock and some other colleagues um, were doing a study. They looked, at, they looked at salaries and bonuses, negotiating annual bonuses. And it turns out there was a 6% difference between men and women at Harvard MBAs when they control for industries, pre-MBA salaries, functional areas, and cities of employment. Still a 6% difference. But when it talks about annual bonuses, 19% different. But the differences disappeared when both groups, males and females, knew what the going rate was. So one of the big differences is women don't ask, and surprisingly, women don't talk, right? The notion of, of you know, what, what, is it, what, are the, what do these networks do? They provide us with an opportunity to be able to get the information, right? So that we know, hey, I'm not being paid the same. I'm not getting the same kind of resources. Well, the impact of these factors are subtle, but they are, but they are, they're subtle, but they are powerful. And it turns out, for example, Newmark sent men and women with equally, with actually the same Vita and resume out to apply for wait staff positions at upscale restaurants, okay? And what they found, women were 40% less likely to be called for an interview, and if called, 50% less likely to be hired. Same resumes. Or you know this study because you've read about it and you said, I knew it was true. <laughs> Golden and Rouse found that putting a screen up for orchestra auditions increased the likelihood by 50% that the woman would move through the evaluation process and increased by 250% that she would get a seat in the orchestra. Right? Pretty amazing. My economist colleagues would say, it can't be. Right? What, what do orchestras want? Great music. They don't care whether it's a male or female who produces the music. All they care about is the music. Doesn't seem to be rational for them to discriminate. Um, well, there are different ways of asking. You know what, the, what, what women face and what, where, how we really kind of basically set ourselves up for these kinds of effects? Is because we have a concern that men really don't have. And the concern that men have is, am I perceived as competent or not? And the concern that we have is, if I'm perceived as competent, can I be liked? So we view the world as a choice. You guys are laughing because you know it's true, right? <laughs> I can either be competent or I can be likable, right? Males typically don't see it as a choice. Competent and liked is fine. We have lots of competent, likable guys. But we have competent women, and we also have pejorative names for them, too, and we have likable women. And by the way, we like to have likable women around us. Liking trumps competency in women, so that's why you've got to bring them together. Once again, being likable or being wealthy, what do you want? <laughs> it turns out, however, though, uh, while men were perceived as much more competent when they used a very task-oriented you know, style of, of interacting with their potential employers, while a social style worked better for women. What I mean by a social style is women were more likely to be hired when they paired their competence with a concern, a communal concern, concern for the organization. Concern, you know what I mean? It's sort of like, it's not enough for me to be competent, I have to also be concerned about 
the organization, where men don't have to have that same kind of level of concern, at least in these studies. Right? So what does this mean? Anatomy is not destiny, but expectations may be. By the way, here's the, the amazing thing. The Cray and All study, where the study is done with uh, negative male stereotypes, negative female stereotypes, when they told the women, by the way, men do better than this, there was a reactance. The women outperformed the men. <laughs> so once again, it's like, oh, yeah? Watch. <laughs> In a study by two, by actually uh, one of my doctoral students, women were willing to pay as much as $1,300. $153 to avoid negotiating the price of a car, while men were only were willing to pay $666. So we, were, we, we paid twice as much, or were willing to pay twice as much, to avoid the negotiation experience. And guess who all the customers are for Saturn? <laughs> and do you think Saturn's a better car? Why is it women overwhelmingly? 63% of Saturn customers are women. And we say, oh, thank you for not putting me in that situation. <laughs> what it says is that if we make it salient, women don't do as well. Women say, oh, yeah, watch me. If we don't, it's just subtle. It has a big impact. So if we said, you know, if we said by the way, you know, we're doing this because you're a female. We're doing this because you're Asian. We're doing this because people re react. And they say, oh, it's not going to be the effect. It's the subtleness of it. For example, in the stereotype threat, Literally, the effect can be had by having people put their names in on an answer sheet and their ethnicity. You can get the effect. That's all you need to do. So, I mean, it's a, it's a powerful effect. Uh, there's a game that we use a lot in research called the ultimatum bargaining game. And here's, I'll do a quick um, description of it. Basically, what it is is there's an allocator and a decider. And the allocator gets to decide how, or gets to make a, an allocation of a dollar amount, let's say $100, between the allocator and the decider. It can go be anywhere from the allocator gets $1 and the decider gets 99 to the allocator gets 99 and the decider gets 1. So the allocator makes an allocation. The information is sent to the decider, and the decider simply has one of two choices. If the decider says yes, the allocation is given to the participants, the allocator decider, exactly as the allocator said it was, or no. And in this case, no money. No money is changed. Nobody gets any money. The game is over. You do it once. Okay, so there's no future. You know, in fact, it's usually done anonymously, so you don't know who your allocator is nor who your decider is. Okay? So in this case, what they did was they told people whether their allocators or deciders were males or females. So they didn't tell them who they were, but they told the gender. And it turns out both men and women allocators, the people making the decision about who gets what, made less generous allocations when the decider was a woman. Ah, she doesn't need that much. She's working for pen money, right? 12% less than when the male was the decider. And both men and women deciders demanded more from women allocators, right? 42.5% more from the women allocators than they were willing to accept from the men allocators. So you know what? We can't rely on, on us to help us out. So as opening offers go, and this is, a, this is you know, part of this is what are your aspirations? Because as opening offers go, so go your expectations. And by the way, so go your final outcomes because there is a very high relationship between how extreme your first offer is and what you finally end up agreeing to. And by the way, this is what is actually the most powerful result, I think, in the whole thing I've presented to you. And that is, if you're, a, if you're negotiating for yourself, you're much better off being a male. If you're negotiating for somebody else, or if somebody else is negotiating for me, I'm much better off if they're a woman. In fact, 14 to 23% better off. While I don't negotiate for myself if I'm a female, I am actually better than men when I negotiate for other people. So let me tell you how I characterized my negotiation when I took my job here at Stanford. All right? My husband, my dogs, and my four horses, they depend on me. <laughs> and I am not negotiating for me. I'm negotiating for them. 
right? So if this, if this is what it takes, then what you're doing is you're negotiating for your, you know, your extended family, for your pets, right? For future generations of women to come after you, you're negotiating for other people. Don't negotiate for yourself. So we're back to that question. How much are you willing to pay to avoid the discomfort of negotiating? So what do we know? Well, women are much less likely to see opportunities to negotiate. They are simply willing, they're much more likely to simply accept or reject an offer rather than attempt a negotiation. But women have the potential to be even better than men at value creation because we have a lot of experience as a low power player, right? And we are willing to incorporate the needs of others into our solution space. Now, that's great. It turns out that makes our value creation much more likely. So if we actually get in a negotiation, we're actually likely to be, do significantly better in value creation for the community. But we don't claim. If you're just talking about salary, you can't create value. Because a dollar more to you is a dollar less to them. But what I mean by creating value is that your compensation package is a multi-issue package. And value creation occurs because we look at not only you know, what my salary is, but what is your research budget? Right? What are your, what's your, what's your, your support for doctoral students? Well, how big is your lab? Right? All of those are a part of the compensation. When we have multiple issues, and one or both of us cares about the value of those issues differently. So let's look at a package rather than getting focused on a single issue. If you're focusing on a single issue, it is value claiming. It's zero sum. But when you bring in multiple issues, you actually have the opportunity to basically create value. Because literally what you're trying to do is sort of like you're appeasing the 800-pound gorilla and taking some for yourself too. Right? So what do we do? We'll sort of um, finish up with a couple of uh, how-tos. Oftentimes, we view negotiations as zero-sum. That is, whatever I get, I have to take from you. And that's one of the reasons that we find negotiations so painful, because it's an adversarial process. But it doesn't have to be. It's adversarial primarily because we expect an adversarial experience and we behave as if we're going to get one and we do right think about how powerful these expectations are all you have to do you can go back to the early 60s in the work that Robert Rosenthal did with sixth graders in Boston and you all probably have heard about these studies these were the Pygmalion studies and what Rosenthal did was he went to the teachers of the sixth grade of some uh, in some Boston schools the beginning of the school year and said We've done a lot of testing. He, you know, I'm from Harvard. We've done a lot of testing of the students in your school. This, by the way, happened in the, in the early 60s when being a social psychologist was really fun because you could still do stuff to people, right? You could shock them. You could lie to them. You could take school kids and manipulate them. We can't do any of that stuff now, right? So what did Rosenthal say? He said, we've tested all your students. And what we found is, we've actually divided them into two groups, group A and group B. Group A students are going to blossom this year. They are really just on the verge of real intellectual development, surprising intellectual development. Group B, they're going to develop as normal sixth graders. Now, in reality, group A and group B, he randomly assigned the sixth graders. There was no difference. He then left. And at the end of the school year, they did achievement tests on all these kids, as they normally did. And what he did was he said, what's the correlation? Did group a, was there no difference now between A and B, or was there? And there was a significant difference. Group A dramatically outperformed group B. Why? Because the teachers expected them to, and they behaved towards them differently. And as a result of expectations, they experienced this intellectual you know, sort of ratcheting up that the regular kids didn't. So what happens is you have this sort of, you know, expectations are powerful effects. So here's what I'm suggesting that you do. You may want to consider some of these ideas. First is don't assume you know what the issues are that are at dispute. And maybe there may be issues over which you're thinking there's a problem when there isn't any. So question, what's the range of opportunities here? 
Secondly, what you need to think about is, what's, what are my interests and what are the interests of the other party? One of the prescriptions I give my MBA students is we, we kind of go through this you know, in my negotiations class about how to negotiate their next employment opportunity is I suggest to them that they think, what's important to me and what's important to my potential employer? And where, are those, where do those importance, where do, they, where do they diverge? Where are things that are important to me that are not very costly to my employer? And where are things that are very costly to them that are not very important to me? So where can I give easily in order to get? And so, you know, we can talk about this in terms of employment contracts. We can talk about this in terms of going out and negotiating your next car, right? You may, you know, dollars are tough, right? Because the salesperson wants as many dollars from you as he or she can get, and you want to keep as many dollars as you can keep, right? But it turns out there may be other issues besides price that make this actually an easier negotiation. What about service? Right? Let me tell you, the service costs them less than you pay. So maybe you might be willing to increase the price of the car in order to get free service. And so that, that's part of what you're trying to Where are the opportunities where how much I value something is different from how much you value or how much it costs you? And I want to basically find things that I value a lot that are not very expensive for you and things that you value a lot that are not very expensive for me. And that's the problem solving. That's the value creation. I want to unbundle or add issues. What we typically do, because we're so uncomfortable in negotiation, is we typically try to get it over really fast. And what that means is we focus on the single issue, which is price. right? And then, of course, we capitulate because we don't like to do it anyway. You know what? Take a deep breath. There actually could be huge opportunities because, in fact, there may be lots of issues where we can create value. And so what we need to do is sort of but bring those issues to the table and not just hope that eventually someone will notice and fill our needs. You've got to basically sort of think, how can I create value? Adding issues or unbundling issues may be a very val va valuable mechanism for doing that. And think about this. About, this is not an adversarial relationship. Most of the negotiations you engage in are not one-off negotiations where you never see the other side again. Most of the negotiations take place among people that you have repeated interactions with. For example, every time you have a meeting, it's a negotiation because somebody wants you to do something or you want them to do something. And the question is, how is it that we can get that to happen? Right? Well, we want to brainstorm about potential solutions. Maybe there's a creative way for us to sort of work through this problem and not simply be adamant about our position. It's $10 or else, right? That's not the way to negotiate. What you really want to say is, what is it I'm trying to achieve? What is it you're trying to achieve? And how can we, through this interaction, get what we both need? And finally, here's if you want to know more. Now, I've given you Babcock and LaShaver. I like this book right here, Negotiating Rationally. Works for me. Um, <laughs> makes a great present. <laughs> and then my colleague Deb Kolb at Simmons wrote a book with her co-author co Judith Williams, The Shadow Negotiation, How Women Can Master the Hidden Agendas that Determine Bargaining Success. So those are three books I would recommend if you're interested in pursuing the topic. Thank you.